Kishirada Madhava ki Panchatattva ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki So I can sit here? Please, yeah, this is... Attack me. And that uh-huh. way, in the, in the back, you can move closer. Because if you move closer, I don't have to talk so loud. Are you, tra- any, are you translating in the back? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Mudhyara timiranda sadhyanam jana shalakaya. Chakshuru Militam Jena Tusmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitana Manabhishtam Tapitam Yena Bhutale Shayam Rupa Pradamayam Dharati Shapadam Titam Mukam Kuruti Vachalam Pangulangayate Girin Yakrapa Tamam Vande Siguru Dinatarinam Mam Vishnu Paraya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Shishunyavari Paschatya Dasatarine so last year at Kirtan Academy I spoke about the ten offenses. But I guess we didn't really spend sufficient time. Thank you. We didn't spend sufficient time on uh, the first offense. So, Doyal Goranga suggested we t- speak about the first offense. Uh, it's a very interesting subject. What's the secret? I don't want to break it. My father always taught me, don't force anything. Because <laughs> if you force it, you may be pushing in the wrong way. You know, you ever do that? You <laughs> force something and you actually break it. I thought it had a little button here that popped. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't want to. Um, so the first offense is to blaspheme. You can say also criticize. We would generally put that in the category of what is known as operage. Vaishnava Parada. And the reason this topic is so interesting <coughs> is because we all know it's wrong and we all do it. At least a little bit. We, we, we all tend to be critical and judgmental by our conditioned nature. So that even though we learn about the disastrous effects of offending devotees, we still have a tendency, tendency to be critical. A little bit, or very critical. So I think we should start by defining what is operad. 
guess some devotees want to know how much can I get, get away with before it's up for us? <laughs> how much can I criticize? Up to what point is it just criticism and when does it become up for us? At what point am I just like not being nice and it's not up for us? Well, in the broadest sense, the Padma Purana says something that practically everything negative, every, every negative attitude or negative word or negative thought or negative action towards a devotee is classified as aparadhas. But of course there's severity. And there, there are list, there's a list of different things which are considered aparadhas, but the least offensive which is considered aparadhas, which helps us understand the broad nature of Aparad is if I see another devotee and I'm not happy. Oh, it's you. And I'm not happy to see you. That's considered Aparad. And of course, sometimes we're not happy to see somebody, especially if we owe them money. <laughs> you won't be happy to see them. Or, you know, or someone you don't get along with or had a fight with or something. You know, or someone who gave a class and you thought that was really weird what they said, and then you see them, and it's like, oh, that's him or her. That's just normal human nature. Right? Now, aparad could be made in the mind, it can be made by words, and, and it can be made by action. So if you're thinking of an ill thought of someone, it's still aparad. It's not, oh, it's Kali Yuga. It, you don't have to suffer for your thinking. That's Sinful actions, you don't suffer for your thinking, but aparad, you suffer. It is considered an aparad. So it's, it's not that if I just think it and don't say it, it's not aparad. It is. If you say it, it's worse. Because now the person hears it, so then they become offended. If you just think in your mind, at least they don't know what you're thinking. But with your words, or then you take some action to offend them, no. There'll be a bigger reaction. And the greater the offense and the greater the devotee, the greater the reaction. So, if I offend Bhakta, Bhakta, what's a good name? <laughs> John. Bhakta John. <laughs> if I offend Bhakta John, you eat too much. Okay, he's a new devotee. It's not a big offense. Probably not much is going to happen to me. But if I tell my guru, you eat too much, there's going to be, there's going to be an effect. Now, what is the effect of Vaishnava Parad? This is a very interesting topic. Because I'm sure you've seen devotees who you may consider sometimes to have made offenses. I mean, if you go on the internet, you will see devotees who, there's no question, they're making very serious offenses. You've probably seen If you're on the internet, inevitably you'll see it. And then you might wonder, if it's true that Vaishnava Parad is destructive, how is this devotee still alive every morning <laughs> to spend another day of making offenses? And how is it that he's chanting his rounds? And just, right? Because when you go to Bhagavatam or Chaitanya Charitamrita and you read the stories about devotees who make offenses, their bhakti is destroyed and sometimes their material life is destroyed. And, and like Sobari Muni, he, what, how many wives did he marry? 100 or, was it 100? Anybody know? 50? I remember 50. 50, 50 or 100, it's still a lot. <laughs> so going from, a, from the position of a, an ascetic he offended Garuda. The result of that offense is he lost whatever mercy he was given. And so he, f he fell into material life. So he, he gave up his spiritual life. So, so that's kind of what we see or what we would expect. Right? And then sometimes we even see the ruination of someone like Ramachandra Puri. His whole family was ruined. Not only his family, the whole village he lived in was ruined. People who were associated with him were ruined. So you see sometimes on a material level, the person is ruined, 
the people in the family, the people in the village. So you expect to see some external manifestation. Prabhupada said, if you offend a Vaishnava, and when he says offend, um, my understanding based on my experience is something fairly serious, or maybe not so serious, but consistent. Maybe not a big offense, but I'm offending you, I'm offending, and every day I'm offending. So, um, consistently offending. Or blasphemy, which, which would include making up lies about a person and broadcasting them, to, trying to defame somebody. The Prabhupada, in one purport, said that if you do that, it will check your spiritual life. And he gives the example of... I don't know if he gives the example, but this is how I remember it. He said your spiritual life will just stop at that point, it will freeze. And until you repent and are given forgiveness, you won't make any, you don't have this, 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 your spiritual assets are like frozen. You don't have access to them. So you're this very elevated devotee, you commit Vaishnava Aparada, and then you degrade kind of into just like, like you're not the same person. Have you seen anyone? Do you know anyone like that? Like who was, you know, very powerful and doing so much, and then they committed offenses, they kind of fell away from Krishna, and they kind of became like ordinary, they lost their shakti. So Prabhupada's saying, that's what happens. He said, but if you take up devotional service, you, you for, ask for forgiveness and so forth, then you'll, the money's still there, now you have access, before you didn't have access. That's kind of the example he gives. So, now, I think the most interesting, one of the most interesting discussions we can have is how does it manifest? Because sometimes we make offenses or other people make offenses and you don't really notice anything. So you think, well, that wasn't that bad. You know, so-and-so Marge gave a class, I, you know, I didn't like it and I told somebody, you know, what's he thinking, who does he think he is, you know, chastising us like that and you know. And I'm still alive and, you know, I, I don't have dysentery and I'm able to chant. So it seems like maybe the Shastra isn't true. That you actually can offend and, or, or maybe it's not an offense. Just to state what you're thinking. Maybe it's not an offense. Well, how do we understand that? And then we also need to understand what, when is it offense and when is it that you're just pointing out a mistake that needs to be rectified or making an observation. I don't, you know, Mara said that I, I always thought it was this. I'm, I doesn't, I, you know, I'm not criticizing him, I'm just questioning, is that actually right? Did he make a mistake? Did he misunderstand? So, um, one thing I think is important to understand, especially in the context of what you're trying to do, which is improve your chanting, that if we're going to come to the level of Shudhanam, which is what we're trying to do, because at that point, that's when our Krishna consciousness is fully revived. So we want to learn how to chant Shudhanam. And if we're committing offenses to devotees, that's the real, that's the real punishment for us. Not that like you fall on your face and everybody can see you're, you're a big offender and you, you can't even get up in the morning and so forth. No, you, you can be up in the morning chanting your rounds, but if we're making offenses, it's going to affect our chapa. So we're like, we're going through all the motions, but inspiration, attitude, level of purity, taste, all these things are going to get affected. And sometimes we don't notice because we don't have much taste anyway. <laughs> so you don't have much taste and you lose some, it's hard to notice, which is kind of normal, right? <laughs> But at least we should understand the philosophy that if I'm making offenses to devotees, I'm offending the holy name, and the definition of shudhanam is chanting without offense. Right? That's, and you can't get shudhanam if you're making offenses. So if I'm still critical of devotees, I can't get shudhanam because I'm still making offense. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I'm barely on the Nama Bas because Nama Bas means I'm trying not to make offense. So if I don't even try not to make offense, then it becomes offensive chanting. And, and, and of course, then you might think, but I'm not offending the holy name, I'm just offending a devotee. <laughs> what does that have to do with the holy name? Right? You know, I'm not offending you, I'm just offending your wife. Why are you upset? You know, obviously he's upset, I'm offending his wife. I mean, if he doesn't like his wife, he won't be upset. <laughs> but if he loves his wife, he's going to be upset. And Krishna loves his devotee. So when his devotee is offended, then Krishna feels that. If Krishna is offended. And Krishna is his name, so then the names. So how can you chant pure name and offend Krishna? This is like doesn't make sense. Right? So sometimes you have these paradoxes in our life, like you're you're chanting, "Oh Krishna, please give me love," and and then you're offending someone. And, oh, he's such an idiot. And it's like this contradiction that I'm I'm criticizing the person Krishna loves, and I'm asking Krishna to give me love, right? You understand? This is a huge paradox. Now, I heard something today which really struck me, and I don't know if it'll strike you, but it hit me in a certain way because I, I've studied this topic, but I never studied this topic a lot, and I've taught it a lot, and I've never thought of it this way. But it's a very simple point. Offense is born in the soil of pride. If there's no pride, we're not going to make offense. So that's where it starts. And this devotee said, he said, look at the Bhagavad Gita, pride is a demoniac quality. And it just hit me, I said, yeah. That's, that is, um, I think it's a very important and powerful way to think of, if I'm offending, I'm exhibiting a demoniac quality. Because none of us, none of us want to think that we're demoniac, right? You want to think you're a demon? You're doing demoniac things. Nobody wants to think. We don't normally think like that, do we? Even after we offend the devotee, we don't think, oh, I just did something demoniac. We just think, I just told the truth about what's going on. I'm just giving you my opinion or observation. The um, first two items of knowledge are humility and pridelessness. So, and what are the qualities of the demoniac qualities? Arrogance, conceit, harshness. <coughs> What's the demoniac quality? And, and to, to prove that, that Aparad finds soil in pride, Bhakti Siddhanta said something, which I um, appreciate so much. He said, He said, I cannot appreciate the devotees because I'm proud. Because I have no, you know, he said, because I have no humility, can't appreciate the devotees. So, you know, flip it around. Um, if I can't appreciate them, then what do I do? I tend to criticize. And so why do I tend to criticize? Because I have no humility. Right? So it's nice to meditate just on this idea that if I'm critical, there's connection with pride, there's a lack of humility, and I'm an exhibiting a demoniac quality. Because, you know, we think, what do we think demoniac is like? You're killing somebody, that's demoniac. You chop their head off. You know, a demon. Demons kill people. We don't think demons criticize devotees. No. We don't think like that. But it's a demoniac quality. And therefore, if you engage in an activity which is certified by Krishna and the Gita as demoniac, how do you make advancement in Krishna consciousness? Doing demoniac things, you can't. Right? So I think it's powerful to, you know, we think, oh, I'm just criticizing, it's normal, I do it all the time. No, it's demoniac. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's of that lower tamasic nature. Yes. I mean, these two qualities, humility and pride, I'm money, I'm 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 right? What is the, I mean, they listed What's one the after another. What's yeah, the what is the difference? It's in the Shishastika. Give all respect for others, think 
No respect for yourself. So, so humility would be but humility even listed separately in Shikshasana, right? Well, yeah. that's that's the two quali the qualities of humility. Give respect. And don't mind any respect for myself, that's mm -hmm. the pride, and give respect is the humility. Because the definition of humility is this is amazing. All right. I know this is like astonishing what it actually is. But the actual meaning of humility is to think everyone is better than you. So right now, if we're taking a poll of the top to the lowest in this room, if you're humble, you'll put your name on the bottom. That's what it is. That's the actual definition of humility. Everyone's better than me. At the same time, you have high self-esteem. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes you think Humble means you like yeah. either yeah. the um, Yeah, it's transcendental too. How it works. It's transcendental to mundane psychology. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you, what, the reason you think that is you think every, naturally I'm on the bottom because everyone in this room is a devotee except me. Mm. So I appreciate you, I appreciate you, I appreciate, I see bhakti in all of you, but I don't see bhakti in myself. That's humility. Pride is, I don't really see bhakti in you, but I see it in me. <laughs> right? You, we're more familiar with that. Mm. Yeah? You familiar with that? Why isn't everyone like a great devotee like me? Like, what, why doesn't everybody think like me? Because I'm the example. I'm the standard of, of what is pure bhakti. What's wrong with all of you? Right? How come you don't think like me? But the pure devotee thinks, oh, you have so much devotion. So there's this nice story where there was a senior brahmachari in Gaudiamat during the time of Bhakti Siddhanta, and they found out he wasn't chanting his rounds, but he was doing service. So they reported that to Bhakti Siddhanta. And so he took on this mood to teach them, not take on, he exhibited this mood to teach them. And he asked him a question, he said, is he doing service? And they said, yes, he's engaged all day, just not chanting. And Bhakti Siddhanta said, what a great devotee. Because if I wasn't chanting my rounds, there's no way I could be doing service. I wouldn't have the strength. But he has so much bhakti, he doesn't even have to chant his rounds. <laughs> and he's still doing service. So he's exhibiting that humility to teach the disciples how to think. Like, who would think like that? Except a pure devotee. We would think, get him out of the ashram, he's a contamination etc., etc. We make all our judgments and analysis. And even though he's been, you know, Brahmachari for 50 years, okay, kick him out, you know. Let's, we tend to think a little bit like that. Maybe not all of us, but it's there a little bit, right? So he wanted to show that mood, that everyone's better than me. What a great devotee. Doesn't even chant his rounds, and he's fully engaged in service. He has so much devotion. What he said was, he has so much bhakti, it's overflowing. He's got reserves of bhakti. He's such a great devotee that even he doesn't chant. He's got so much, he can keep going. Would you have thought like that? If I told you, you know, Dayagoranga is not chanting anymore, what would you think? Oh, get me out of Kirtan Academy. You know? This is bogus. You know? I mean, you know, would you think, oh my God, what a great devotee. He doesn't have to chant. He's better than me. Who would think like that? So, that's the definition of humility. So it's kind of even seem to be, I mean, is it redundancy in, uh, in Shikshashtaka? Because Trinada is, I mean, you humble at the same, and then, you know, you don't respect, respect for self, give respect to others. Tolerance is also mm -hmm. kind of part of humility. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, why, why Lord Chaitanya would be, I mean, redundant in this kind of... Yes, ma'am. I see it as, a, as, as aspects of it. Mm -hmm. I could praise you, mm -hmm. but I could want praise for myself also. At the same time. Right. Yeah, or I want to be praised for praising you, or I like to praise you, but I like to be praised. So the complete definition is, I like to praise you, and I don't want praise. So the humility and the pridelessness. Mm. 
You have to classify both. And envy? They all go together. What's pride? What is what is primary? Pride? It's probably depends who you talk to. Because if we say envy is the cause of fall, then it's primary. Yeah. But someone will say, but you can't have envy if you weren't proud. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like that. No problem. You but, get but, proud, and then you but, envy, and then you fall. My realization is, material life, it means pride, and spiritual life means reducing pride. And the more humility develops, the more Krishna conscious you are. The more humility you have, the more Krishna conscious you are. Of course, it's a paradox in the sense: the more Krishna conscious you become, the more humble you'll be. But, but if you don't have humility you don't have Krishna consciousness. Because it's pride that got us here, it's pride that keeps us here. And therefore, understanding this, when you find yourself criticizing, you should stop and go, oh, this is a sign I'm not healthy. Because this is a sign of my pride. Right? Or sometimes someone tells you, you did something wrong. What's your first reaction? Yeah, I didn't, or how dare you say that, or you do it too, and so forth. But when you become aware that you can't be perfectly Krishna conscious unless you're humble, and then you can take these opportunities as, okay, here's a chance to become humble, here's also a chance to not be humble, to resist, right? So if you see it, if you see it that way, then it's easier to take it and say, okay, Krishna's giving me an opportunity here. And if I can become more humble, then I can become a pure devotee. If I can't become humble, I can't become a pure devotee. It's the pride that's keeping me here. And so, I have a relationship with Krishna, and what's getting in the way? It's my pride. And when I develop full humility, there's nothing in the way anymore. It's the pride that's in the way. Because the pride is me trying to compete with Krishna. And when there's no pride, there's no competition. And the more there's pride, the more there's competition. So when you understand that, it's a little easier to manifest humility in situations that maybe previously were difficult for you to be humble in, or to admit that you made a mistake. And so let's say I point out a mistake, and you think, oh, this is a good opportunity for me to be humble. I'll admit it. And I'll, I'll learn how to accept that. Because it'll help me. You know, you know, the problem is, we all like to show off. And we all want other people to think highly of us. So you may want other people to think you're Krishna conscious. But that's not what a Krishna conscious person does. They don't go around trying to get other people to think that they're good devotees or pure devotees. They actually don't think they're good devotees. So why would they try to get people to believe they're good devotees? They don't even believe it. Right? And you may think, I'm not a good devotee, but God forbid everybody finds out. I'll be so embarrassed. So better... I let them think I'm a good devotee. And so that mentality destroys our bhakti. Right? It's, it's opposed to bhakti. Right? It's opposed to humility. And that lack of humility, as we're saying, is where, where the offenses are rooted. Right? Do humble people judge or do proud people judge? Do humble people criticize or do proud people criticize? Do humble people offend? Or do proud people of them? So, if I'm offending, then I should think, oh, that's a manifestation of pride. That's how I should think. But when I offend, sometimes I think, he deserved it. Or I'm smarter than him, and I can see what's wrong. Right? Or my standard, he's not on my standard. My standard is what is right. 
and he's not doing what I do, therefore I have a right to judge him. And if that goes by us and we don't recognize it, that means pride is blinding us. And then we're feeding that pride. And so what happens? Another day of japa where I'm not getting that taste and I'm wondering why. Why am I not getting that taste? Because in some subtle or gross way I'm offending devotees. Right? There's a, there's a, I don't know where this comes, it might be from Bhaktivinoda Thakur, but he lists all the reasons that cause one to offend a devotee. Things like birth, caste, gender, ethnicity, body, position, like, oh, he's just or she's just to this. Oh, that means I have a right to, to put them down. He's not a guru or sannyasi, so he's not a senior devotee, so yeah, he's nobody. You know, I can treat him any way I want. Oh, he was born in some weird country, I and mean, they're all thieves in that country. No. Don't give him the time of day. Don't even talk to him. Like that mentality, that prejudice. It's deeply rooted, isn't it? You know? Like you see a sannyasi, oh, he's a great devotee. You see somebody else, oh, ordinary devotee. Oh, GBC, oh, he must be great. Oh, Brahmachai, they're nothing. That mentality, that's what it, this, 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 I don't know where it comes from, says these are reasons we make offenses. We're looking at the externals. Caste. Um, so many reasons. Occupation. Oh, he's just a street sweeper. You want to see? You want to meet? You want to get purified tomorrow? Go about seven o'clock or six thirty to the Grihast area, and there's a little short guy sweeping the street. And just stop there, and he'll stop sweeping, and he'll pay obeisance. You look at him, you'll understand what humility means. He's humble. Just look at him. He's sweeping the street. And he's like, I've been doing that forever. And that's his seva. And he's happy. Would you be happy sweeping the street? There's no prestige there. You know? yeah, he might be happy. But, uh, you'll, people will treat you like a street sweeper. Yeah, if you're happy doing that, that's a sign of humility. So now, the mystery. You offend a Vaishnava, or you see someone offend a Vaishnava, and there they are the next morning at Mangalati. Seems like everything's just fine. Right? And it's confusing. So how? But it's Shastra says that you offend a devotee. You suffer. How is he going on every day? So I've thought about this a lot because it because I've seen it a lot, and it's, it's a little confusing, because as I said, in Shastra, when you offend, you just tend to fall, although we've seen devotees fall, but then we wonder, well, why this one fell, not this one? It seems like this one's worse than that one. This is my conclusion. I, I haven't read this in Shastra. It may be there. But if someone has an offensive mentality, that's a sign that they've fallen. So it doesn't have to be necessarily, sh it doesn't have to show up in a way that you might compute as fallen. Because Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, you can chant a hundred rounds and not make any advancement if you're offending the holy name. So you're chanting a hundred, oh, he's chanting a hundred rounds. But he's offending the holy name. So he's not making any advancement. So, so if someone maintains an offensive mentality, that's proof that they're fallen. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, I believe it's in the story of Ramchandra Puri. So you, you may know the story of Ramchandra Puri, how he he set up Lord Chaitanya to overeat. He encouraged him to overeat, and then he criticized him for overeating. Like, you know, classic example. You couldn't classic fault finder. Get them to do something wrong. Invite them over to your house, get them to do something, you know, bring in your beautiful daughter and tell your daughter to sit next, shoot pictures on. 
Or I was sitting next to my daughter. You know, put it on a Facebook. You know. <laughs> my daughter wants to learn this shloka. Can you teach it to her? He goes, okay. So he's talking to his daughter. Too. Look at how intimate and close they are. Like that, you know. What could be worse? So Prabhupada said, because Ram Chandra Puri was like that, he said he was situated in criticism. It was like his constitutional position. He could not stop criticizing. That's all he, all he could do. So have you ever seen someone like that? I think we have that friend on YouTube. From where? Where is he from? The, some Baltic country you've seen? Yeah, yeah. we talked about the Hanumandas. <laughs> what Hanumandas? Yeah. Like, so when I look at something like that, you know, um, I think that it, it reminds me of what Prabhupada saying, situated in criticism, like you can't stop. Like you just can't stop. So they said, but he gets up every morning and, you know, he does Mangalarti and so on and so forth. So how can I know what is the result of that aparad? Because we always heard that if you commit offense, you'll suffer. And that's the proof that he can't stop criticizing. That's my yeah. conclusion. Because that's not the sign of a devotee. So you have fallen. You just keep doing devotional service, but you're fallen. Because you're doing something that devotees don't do. Yes? And sometimes it seems we don't need to rationalize what is happening to us. Because like Ramachandra Puri, he's Jatila in the spiritual world. So it's his constitutional position to bring trouble. <laughs> so maybe this devotee... From, from a spiritual world, and he has mission to criticize, you know, keep everybody on their toes. So, but if he's getting away with it, it doesn't mean I will get away with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So, but you don't need to listen. So I'm thinking, you know, if something not happening to somebody else, does not rationalize. He's got something good going on, so he's getting away with it. But no, I'm joking. But yeah. it, you know, in a way, it's like. Uh. Who, who, what you know what i need to learn is to see that i'm not doing it yeah. because i will suffer if others seemingly not suffering yeah. what has to do with my life yeah. the shastra says if you commit vaishnava parad you'll lose everything yeah. all your pious activities you like everything will be lost so, so maybe not immediately um it, you know you have two sides of bhakti so you know, you might be doing good here and counteracting to some degree your offenses, but Prabhupada, okay, let me let me just kind of clue you into how Prabhupada dealt with criticism of devotees. There's a story. One devotee, this was in the early days, so if there was a problem you could go to Prabhupada. Because, you know, they were all like a small group of devotees with Prabhupada. And so one devotee said, and Prabhupada, the men are mistreating the women, this and that, I feel really bad. And something, I forget, something like that. And Prabhupada said, are you perfect? And she said, no. He said, he said they're trying. Just leave them alone, they're trying. So that's how he, he dealt with it. He didn't say, oh yeah, I know, those men are so bad, you know. He didn't, that wasn't his mood. Or somebody didn't like something. They felt that a devotee's actions weren't proper. And Prabhupada would say, then you act properly, and by your good example, they'll learn how to act. He never took it negative. He never wanted to go into the negative side. I always wanted to resolve it with something positive. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta always also. Because they were very careful not to create a mood in which criticism would become normal and acceptable. Because it's not really acceptable and it's not supposed to be acceptable in Vaishnava communities. So he he didn't feed, uh, feed into it. He wouldn't when the devotees were critical, he wouldn't um, He wouldn't energize it. Um, There's another story. A devotee was criticizing somebody or something. So after he complained, he told the devotee, okay, go out. And then he brought the devotee in that he was complaining about and discussed it privately. 
he wasn't like, okay, we're all going to get on him. And so it wasn't the mood. So if, but this discussion is all about if you want to chant pure names, you can't be critical of devotees. And so we need to find out what is causing us to be critical. Because if we just talk about how bad Aparat is, it's not enough to stop us from doing what I do. I have experience. I've given many classes, and, and some of the classes I felt were inspired, they were deep philosophically, and, but it has to go deeper than that. Like we have to connect with, with that pride within us that's, that's nourishing that need and desire and inspiration to criticize. It's very deep and it's very strong. Yes. It is said that one should tolerate offenses or whatever, uh, criticism towards oneself, yes. but not yes. tolerate towards others. Yes. On one hand, on other hand, Vindavadasta Kuru says, if two devotees quarrel, you should never take side. side. Yeah. So can you elaborate maybe in which situation you need to act and which situation oh, yeah. you know, to keep aloof. Well, the first idea is that let's say I'm being criticized. So I shouldn't try to defend myself. I mean, if it's a practical matter, you might want to defend yourself because maybe there's a misunderstanding mm. and you have to resolve something practically, but you shouldn't try to defend your ego. That's like a devotee never tries to defend his ego. That's just a principle. It's not, it's not proper behavior. Um, in, but if another devotee is being harmed, then it's the duty of the devotee to defend the other devotee, whether it's physical harm or spiritual harm. It's our duty to defend and protect the other devotee. Mm -hmm. To protect their ego or protect them, but not to protect our own. That's the principle. No. You'll have to apply your judgment in every situation, whether that's um, proper or not. But it's a principle. Like, because eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, that's defending. Right? I'm defending my ego, that's defending. And you're supposed to reduce your defending. No, no, I didn't do it wrong. I didn't do it. I didn't make a mistake. It's his fault. You know. Sometimes you just don't do that. You just, if it doesn't have practical implications, then maybe it's better just, okay, I'll take the humble position. So that's the idea. We don't defend. But if I'm defending another devotee, it's nothing about my ego, but it's about my service to that devotee, my compassion. So that's always there. The devotees attack, you defend them. Attack verbally, defend them. So what you do with this principle when two, two devotees, devotees disagree? Yes. Um, because in our yeah. society, it's usually a devotee attacks another devotee. Oh, attack in an argument, yeah. Oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you were saying, okay, Lucky is, you're, you're lying about her, right? then I would defend her. If it's a sedantic argument, mm -hmm. she's making good points, you're making good points, then the injunction is don't take sides because then, then half the room is with her and half the room is with you and then we end up hating one another. So in order not to degrade our own consciousness and to degrade the environment, we just you know, don't deal with it. Like Prabhupada would sometimes explain to us mistakes that he saw that were made in the Gaudiya Mantra. And he didn't want us to make those mistakes. And that's why he explained it. And he thought we could make those mistakes. But then, sometimes devotees would levy the same criticisms against the Gaudiya Mat 
that Prabhupada made, and Prabhupada said, you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. These are my god brothers. So, you know, there's kind of rules of the game. I think he also does it with love and compassion and without envy. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, he was doing it, he was doing it for us, you know, in the sense, like, taking a chance of, you know, if, if somebody, let's say, gave a class, and I felt they said something wrong, and I wanted to explain that because I, I feel it was detrimental. I'm taking a chance of offending that devotee, but my motive is because I'm convinced that what they said is, is not exactly what Prabhupada says or meant. Or so, and that's why Prabhupada apologized at the end. Mm -hmm. He said, I did it for them. And I just heard something this morning. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, in Prabhupada's books and in different statements, he was pointing out mistakes, as I was saying, of Gaudiya Mat. And sometimes, you know, it was even directly in, in private conversations, he would even talk about individuals. Um, Prabhupada always said, you can say anything, but don't write it down. So, he, you know, what he wrote down were general things. If it's specific things about a person, he wouldn't write down. But he might say it for us. So we know. So, as you may know, in the end, Prabhupada asked that forgiveness be given to all his god brothers and money be given to the temples and like that. So today, I was online and I heard this amazing talk by the devotee who was delegated to go and meet all the people Prabhupada criticized. You know, the Kasko Swamis, the Nityananda Vamsa, mm -hmm. the, you know, the Radha Krishna, Japa Hare Krishna, Rama, you know, whatever that mantra is. Those people, mm -hmm. like all the people. He was commissioned to go give donations to their temples, meet the Mahant, and ask for forgiveness. What an interesting service. And he had to like find all these people all around my wow. All the ones Prabhupada talked about. All the ones he... With the bogus mantras this, and the bogus philosophy this. <laughs> and he said, everybody, without exception, accepted him with open arms, gave him prasadam, and gave him love and affection, and said, your guru made no offense. Every single one of them. Isn't that amazing? To hear? To, that's a Vaishnava. You know, that's what it means to be a Vaishnava. Vaishnava will never take offense. Right? You might know this story. There's another beautiful story. It's very similar. And I think these stories are very helpful for us because we don't... We don't... You know, we're all devotees, but we don't have deep experience of Vaishnava culture because we all come from different cultures. So we're, we're trying to be Vaishnavas but we're pretty much situated in our culture and we're trying to learn the other culture. But when you see people who grew up in the culture and how they act, that affects your heart deeply. So you might have heard this story. It's a beautiful story. I think it was like November of 1970. Prabhupada wanted about 50 devotees to come to India and begin preaching in India. Like take... They're all Americans at that time. Yeah, yeah. most of the movement was American then. So these are all Americans as far as I know. About 50 Americans went to India with Prabhupada. Or were supposed to be 50, I don't know how many exactly. But there was a group. And so these are all young devotees. And so they're coming to India. And you know, Indian culture... You know what Indian culture is. And these are all brand new young devotees. You know, a year or two ago they were hippies and they're all in their early 20s. And so they, they're very passionate. And ISKCON doesn't have much culture. They're, you know, we didn't, nobody had been to India, so we didn't have any culture. It was just American hippie. Our temples were basically just like hippie communes, except for the devotees. <laughs> basically. I mean, we weren't having sex or anything, but... But the basic culture, you know, boys and girls, just friends, and, you know. So they went to India, and it was creating problems. 
because they didn't have the culture and they were even stealing from the shops because they thought it's all for Krishna. And so, you know, eating with their left hand and being, you know what Americans are like, they're kind of loud and unrefined, can be loud and unrefined and boisterous and obnoxious sometimes and, and you know, enthusiastic devotees. <laughs> could be more obnoxious. You know. So the way I was told the story is the devotees were staying in someone's home. And the man and the, the family was serving them, hand and foot, like menial servants, feeding them three times a day, cleaning their room, washing their clothes, just asking them whatever you want. And these arrogant young Americans were just like, yeah, give me this, do that, you know, just <laughs> bossing them around, like yeah, we're devotees and they should be serving us. Of course, these people are devotees also, but they, they thought they were special. So basically, as far as the story goes, as I was told, they were kind of mistreating these people. And at the end, when they're leaving, the man gives them, you know, gives them dhoti, sorry, money, you know, gifts. Yeah, that's what you do, you give your guests gifts. And he's crying. And the devotees are leaving, and he said, if there's any offense I've committed, please forgive me. Tears in his eyes, and Prophet said, you see that? He said, that is a Vaishnava. He said, you note that, that is a Vaishnava. Devotee's just offending this person day and night, and then he's asking for forgiveness any offenses he made. So, these things are important for us to understand. Right? But that's what it means to be a devotee. And I think the challenge we have is most of the devotees where we live are, they, don't, they weren't born Vaishnavas. And even if they were born of American or Western families, it's different. They're not coming from like, 20 generations of Vaishnavas, you know, grandmother, grand, great grandma, you know, just like doing puja from three, and you know. So we don't see enough of that. And as Westerners, you know, being arrogant is kind of like, that's just normal. If you want to get anything done, you have to be a little arrogant and pushy, and, right? And then we think, we think being humble is like you're going to get pushed around. Yeah, maybe in your country it's not so bad. You know, Buddhists, they're kind of soft. But, yeah, America, wow. Germany. I don't know, I've never been to Russia. But in all Western countries. We don't have a lot of examples of this level of humility. So, in order to create a, keep a humble position, we don't take sides because you don't want to offend another devotee by taking sides. And then you just say, it's a chinta, it's inconceivable. I can't understand who's right and who's wrong. It's just, you know, they're trying to please Krishna. That's how you see it. Right? So, should we have some questions now? Or you want to take a break? Or Maybe do five, headstands? Or five minute break? Or what? Five minute break? Yeah, take a break. Then... You can stand on your head for five minutes. Yeah. Wakes you up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that? What? If you're tired, a headstand's better than a nap. Really? Yeah. I don't like to stand. What? <laughs> headstand is better. Especially if you stand on somebody else's head. <laughs> yeah. Like a, uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Try it sometime. Yeah. Five minute headstand. It just over. brings oxygen to the brain, right? Wakes you up, yeah. Blood. In, in case you have brain. It's, all right. <laughs> it's missing. That's why I probably need it all the more. <laughs> ah, yes. Mm. We call it a guy tree brain. <laughs> oh, the sun setting? Yeah, oh, it's okay. a sun yeah. That's good. Yes, He's really good at keeping us on track. Yeah, I have the morning done. I do it.